23. Tide of Passion. They were talking on the threshold of Vesper's room when the proprietor left them. Bond pushed her inside and closed the door. Then he put his hands on her shoulders and kissed her on both cheeks. This is heaven, he said. Then he saw that her eyes were shining. Her hands came up and rested on his forearms. He stepped right up against her and his arms dropped round her waist. Her head went back and her mouth opened beneath his. My darling, he said. He plunged his mouth down onto hers, forcing her teeth apart with his tongue and feeling her own tongue, working at first shyly and then more passionately. He slipped his hands down to her swelling buttocks and gripped them fiercely, pressing the centers of their bodies together. Panting, she slipped her mouth away from his and they clung together while he rubbed his cheek against hers and felt her hard breasts pressing into him. Then he reached up and seized her hair and bent her head back until he could kiss her again. She pushed him away and sank back exhausted onto the bed. For a moment, they looked at each other hungrily. I'm sorry, Vesper, he said. I didn't mean to then. She shook her head, dumb with the storm which had passed through her. He came and sat beside her, and they looked at each other with lingering tenderness as the tide of passion ebbed in their veins. She leant over and kissed him on the corner of the mouth. Then she brushed the black comma of hair back from his damp forehead. My darling, she said. Give me a cigarette. I don't know where my bag is. She looked vaguely round the room. Bond lit one for her and put it between her lips. She took a deep lungful of smoke and let it pour out through her mouth with a slow sigh. Bond put his arm round her, but she got up and walked over to the window. She stood there with her back to him. Bond looked down at his hands and saw that they were still trembling. It's going to take some time to get ready for dinner, said Vesper, still not looking at him. Why don't you go and bathe? I'll unpack for you. Bond left the bed and came and stood close against her. He put his arms round her and put a hand over each breast. They filled his hands and the nipples were hard against his fingers. She put her hands over his and pressed them into her, but still she looked away from him, out of the window. Not now, she said, in a low voice. Bond bent and burrowed his lips into the nape of her neck. For a moment he strained her hard to him, then he let her go. All right, Vesper, he said. He walked over to the door and looked back. She had not moved. For some reason he thought she was crying. He took a step towards her and then realized there was nothing to say between them then. My love, he said. Then he went out and shut the door. Bond walked along to his room and sat down on the bed. He felt weak from the passion which had swept through his body. He was torn between the desire to fall back full length on the bed and the longing to be cooled and revived by the sea. He played with the choice for a moment, then he went over to his suitcase and took out a white linen bathing drawers and a dark blue pajama suit. Bond had always disliked pajamas and had slept naked until in Hong Kong at the end of the war he came across the perfect compromise. This was a pajama coat which had come almost down to his knees. It had no buttons, but there was a loose belt round the waist. The sleeves were wide and short, ending just above the elbow. The result was cool and comfortable, and now, when he slipped the coat on over his trunks, all his bruises and scars were hidden except the thin white bracelets on his wrists and ankles and the mark of smirch on his right hand. He slipped his feet into a pair of dark blue leather sandals and went downstairs and out of the house and across the terrace to the beach. As he passed across the front of the house, he thought of Vesper, but he refrained from looking up to see if she was still standing at the window. If she saw him, she gave no sign. He walked along the waterline on the hard golden sand until he was out of sight of the inn. Then he threw off his pajama coat and took a short run and a quick flat dive into the small waves. The beach shelved quickly and he kept underwater as long as he could, swimming with powerful strokes and feeling the soft coolness all over him. Then he serviced and brushed the hair out of his eyes. It was nearly seven and the sun had lost much of its heat. Before long it would sink beneath the further arm of the bay, but now it was straight in his eyes and he turned on his back and swam away from it so he could keep it with him as long as possible. When he came ashore nearly a mile down the bay, the shadows had already engulfed his distant pajamas, but he knew that he had time to lie on the hard sand and dry before the tide of dusk reached him. He took off his bathing trunks and looked down. There were only a few traces left of his injuries. He shrugged his shoulders and lay down, with his arms spread out in a star, and gazed up at the empty blue sky and thought of Vesper. His feelings for her were confused, and he was impatient with the confusion. They had been so simple. He had intended to sleep with her as soon as he could, because he desired her, and also because, and he admitted it to himself, he wanted coldly to put the repairs to his body to the final test. He thought they would sleep together for a few days, and then he might see something of her in London. Then he would come to the inevitable disengagement, which would be all the easier because of their positions in the service. If it was not easy, he could go off on an assignment abroad, or, which was also in his mind, he could resign and travel to different parts of the world as he had always wanted. But somehow she had crept under his skin, and over the last two weeks his feelings had gradually changed. He found her companionship easy and unexacting. There was something enigmatic about her which was a constant stimulus. She gave little of her real personality away, and he felt that however long they were together there would always be a private room inside her which he could never invade. She was thoughtful and full of consideration without being slavish and without compromising her arrogant spirit. 
and now he knew that she was profoundly, excitingly sensual. But that was the con conquest of her body, because of the central privacy in her would each time have the sweet tang of rape. Loving her physically would each time be a thrilling voyage without the anticlimax of arrival. She would surrender herself avidly, he thought, and greedily enjoy all the intimacies of the bed without ever allowing herself to be possessed. Naked, Bond lay and tried to push away the conclusions he read in the sky. He turned his head and looked down the beach and saw that the shadows of the headland were almost reaching for him. He stood up and brushed off as much sand as he could reach. He reflected that he would have a bath when he got back in, and he absentmindedly picked up his trunks and started walking back along the beach. It was only when he reached the pajama coat and bent to pick it up that he realized he was still naked. Without bothering about the trunks, he slipped on the light coat and walked on to the hotel. At that moment, his mind was made up. <laughs>